Massapequa, and we couldn't wait. We used to go around to uh, CBGB's once a month to try to get a record deal. It just wasn't happening fast enough for us. We were very urgent about the whole thing, and we're 19 years old. But there was an urgency to we better do this now. So we went to London, and uh, through, really, we were homeless. We, we uh, you know, we were on a, a, you know, this big adventure, and we had a double bass and a guitar case, a drum under our arm, and like lots of suitcases with bowling shirts and uh, you know pink pants in it. And and, and um, we um, we got there and said, "Great, we don't have a phone, we don't have a phone number, we don't have any clue of what we're doing." You you said it was a good idea. No, you said it was a good idea to come. It was classic. So so we just knocked on doors. I just met um, uh, a Ross Halford, who was the photographer at the first show we ever went to. We went to a show by the Cockney Rejects, because we got a copy of the, the, um, like the LA Weekly, the Time Out in London, and Cockney Rejects, that sounds really cool, right? That sounds like English. We'll go there, and we'll tell them how great we are, and then we'll get a record deal. We go to the Cockney Rejects at the Electric Ballroom in Camden, and we walk in with drape coats on, uh, uh, white shoes, you know, uh, cowboy tie, the, the whole rig. And it's a hardcore punk rock that had morphed into skinhead, which m m had morphed into like national, and we just walked into it. This is cool, everyone's, and there's, it's not cool. It's, <laughs> we didn't really know that there was these kind of tribal divisions. We thought anyone with any haircut was cool against the squares. It was a punk rock or a teddy boy or mods or you know, skinheads. We didn't think, we didn't, we thought everyone was just cool. And we found ourselves in the middle of a riot and uh, hiding behind the bar. And we had armed ourselves with the bottles in case anyone came. And the, the thing that I remember very clearly is seeing a dog. And then we look up and there's a leash. And then we look up, and there's a cop, a woman cop, with a helmet right out of a movie. And we, we've been in Massapequa until two days ago, and I, we had no reference point for any of this. And, and she said to us, you teddy boys better get out of here. <laughs> and we were spilled out onto the street, because no one really noticed us in the riot. There was so much going on that they really didn't notice. So, so we got spilled out onto the street, and we're walking down some kind of rough street in Camden, and we see three or four of these skinheads who had been in the club spray painting this homeless guy. Aww. And we really knew at that point, we gotta get something going here. We're, because we're stuck. Either we earn a little bit of bread and get back to New York or somehow make a dent here, but we gotta get something going. This might have been an ill-advised scheme of ours. <laughs> <laughs> so we basically lived like that for about three, four months, knocking on doors, being at what we heard was some groovy party, and met Billy Duffy, Steve Jones, all the people who we're still friends with. All of our gang was there. And so when we finally knocked on enough doors to get a gig, fourth on the bill at a pub, four o'clock in the afternoon, four songs, it was four as I remember, a lot of stuff in England. Uh, okay, you got four songs, you got four, you know, you got four o'clock in the afternoon, okay. So by the time we got to the opening act, four o'clock pub, uh, pub gig, we had met a lot of people that were probably tired of hearing our story. Joe Strummer, Chrissy Hines, Steve Jones, Billy Duffy, a lot of people who are here right now, my pals, who we're still friends with <coughs> to this day, wanted to go to the gig just to shut these guys up. We've heard the story, they go to all the parties, they mooch around, we, and this is what we had been waiting for. One, two, three, you guys, go. You got 20 minutes, this is your life. And we were really good at it. We've been doing it in New York, four sets a night, five nights a week, for a year in front of you know people from Long Island and you know a couple times in the city and all that. So when we were told, one, two, three, go, this is 20 people are in the audience, but 10 of them are super cool and you know, you've met them, we were very good. And in London back then, well, England was very London kind of centric at this time. So if you got in the music papers, it spread. And uh, within a few months, we did maybe 10 or, or, or so of these like little kind of now they're legendary uh, pub gigs opening up a lot of times. Uh, 
there was a big buzz about it. And uh, we did one last one, and there was a big buzz about it. We were told the, uh, the Daily Mirror was going to cover it, and this and that. And we were the opening act, and the band who was the headliner wouldn't change spots. So we went on again at the venue in Victoria Station very early, and the Daily Mirror covered it. And we were on the cover with Lady Die the next day, I remember. And we still had no money. We had nowhere to live. We had nothing. And we're on the cover of the Daily Mirror. And that same night, maybe they kind of spoke amongst themselves, but the Rolling Stones came. Wow. All of them, which was like wow. the first time that they've been in the same room, uh, <laughs> unprompted, or by, you know, not to do a gig of their own in, in a long time. So that made the papers. And then there was a mad rush to get us signed. And again, we're by ourselves. We're three guys, you know, we had a guy that we brought with us who was a bartender at one of the clubs we used to play at in New York because he was English. Well, you'd be the drummer, you'd be the bass player, you'd be the manager, and it was, so we had a guy who quickly didn't work out. So, so we're by ourselves, and then one of the uh, next few gigs, Dave Edmonds came, who was the other star of the show, really. Uh, and there was a bunch of record companies that wanted it. We met with Richard Branson, who I think I would have, in hindsight, gone with him because we could probably get business class on the on the uh, <laughs> on Virgin Airlines, and he thought we were smashing good fun, and he loved us. And for whatever reason, we went with someone else. And but we had to get the studio very quickly to make the record. And this is all six months before we were living in our parents' house in Massapequa, and now we're being wanted to dine with the Stones. They wanted to produce us, uh, so we would met, meet with Nick one day. And then we went to the country, went to Keith at his country house, and they really loved it. And those guys are fantastic. They love rock and roll music, and they wanted to do it, but it's very hard to organize the whole thing with guys like that and guys like us who we were very f flattered and thrilled by it all, but we really still had nowhere to live and we had no money and we were like being born. And we were happy when people took us to lunch because that's that was our lunch. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so Dave Edmonds, who's really the star of the show when it comes to the recording, uh, was was in the audience, and he came came to us, and he had a little bit of a reputation around England. He had rock pile, I think. I'm not sure if that had hit yet, but he was the kind of respected cat, and uh, he invited us to his house. He had a little house out in the uh, Duffy and Old Parsons Green down that way, and he had a little basement. With a dark board and a little like an English pool table that they're this big and they have two shots if you make very strange <laughs> but, um, and, so, and he had a jukebox and he had the races on by George Jones and the first couple of Elvis singles amongst everything else and we heard that and he really opened up to us and said that he's been looking to do this for a long time and he saw he was like Sam Sam Phillips trying to find Elvis Presley and not to compare ourselves to that, but that's what he said and I found you guys and please let me do this before someone who doesn't know what they're doing. Because we could have gone any producer, they all wanted to do it uh, because it was very in vogue at the moment. So we went with Dave Edmonds, record company, agreed to it, and all this is in live time. We signed the record deal one day, the next day we met with Edmonds, and it was all kind of fluid. And we went in the, the, the very next day to a big recording studio and they had microphones on the drums, and like I didn't really know what that meant. I just thought you put the microphone on the singing, and I didn't really know the whole process of doing it. Brian is a very intuitive guy. I think he knew what he what what he wanted to sound like as a guitar player, and we knew what was good as a band, but we didn't know how to get that onto a uh, again to date myself onto a tape. We didn't really know how to do that, and Edmonds was 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 really the star of the show. Um, I, I actually said, why do we have a microphone on the drum? I'm like, hit it, everyone can hear this, right? You guys can hear this. He said, I'll explain it to you as we go along. <laughs> so, uh, and that day we cut Rock This Town, Runaway Boys, and I think the next day we did Straight Cast, we, we kind of recorded very quickly things that would now, 35 years later, be kind of classic things. And those few songs really started a very long adventure for me. And uh, I'm like, ultimately, very thankful to the other two guys and and Dave Edmonds we made these records and and it quickly kind of happened and 